Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to the release of our new report, Understanding the B-21 Raider, America's Deterrence Bomber. Today's conversation is focused on the B-21's potential and how it's a major step toward creating a force that convinces our potential enemies that the cost of aggression will outweigh any gains. Now, the Air Force's enduring focus is to provide global reach and global power to defend our nation, and that means it must be prepared to strike any target, anytime, anywhere. This requires a force of long-range, stealthy bombers that can penetrate highly contested airspace to strike thousands of targets within days. Now, everyone knows, because they've heard it from our secretary and other leaders in the administration, that China is our pacing challenge. And that's why the Air Force must field large numbers of B-21s as quickly as possible if we have any hope of deterring uh, aggressive action from China. To discuss our report and recommendations, we have with us the author, retired Colonel Mark Gonzo Gunsinger, Director of Future Concepts and Capability Assessments here at the Mitchell Institute. Gonzo was a B-52 pilot, longtime planner on the Air Staff, Director on the National Security Council Staff, and a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. We're also really fortunate today to be joined by Major General Armo Armagost, Director of Strategic Plans, Programs, and Requirements at the Air Force's Global Strike Command. He's been instrumental in the modernization of our nuclear forces, and the B-21 is a major part of his portfolio. I'd also like to welcome him back from Europe, where he spent the last several months coordinating efforts to provide support to Ukraine. So welcome back, Armo, and uh, thanks for uh, joining us. So Gonzo, let's uh, jump right in and, and begin with an overview of your paper. Uh, and for those of you in the audience, uh, feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A window anytime during the discussion. And uh, we'll get to those at the back end of the program. So over to you, Gonzo. Yeah, thank you, General Abdullah, General Armagast, uh, and, and welcome back. So I'm going to, next slide, I'm going to start off with an irrefutable fact, which is DOD's combat air forces are now overbalanced towards shorter range aircraft with smaller payloads and bombers. And most are still fourth gen or earlier systems that are not designed for today's contested environments. So our report makes five recommendations to change that force mix. The first is directly aligned with the defense strategy, you can see from the quote, but to do that at the scope and the scale needed for peer conflicts, DOD must also prioritize the most cost-effective capabilities for high-volume, long-range strikes into contested areas. And that means prioritizing penetrating bombers. Slide. So defense leaders also talking about the growing need to deter two nuclear peers, China and Russia. Now, we think that should also be a poor sizing requirement and recommend that DOD begin to increase the size of its triad, and nuclear and conventional capable B-21, so-called dual capable B-21s, would be the more cost-effective way to do that compared to building more ICBM silos and SSBNs, which are very expensive. So we propose there should be three additive requirements for sizing the future bomber force. First, it should have the capacity to defeat Chinese aggression in the Pacific. Second, it should also be sized to deter or defeat opportunistic aggression in another theater. And finally, it should be the foundation for deterring two nuclear peers. And that adds up to at least 300 bombers, slightly more than double today's force. Now, of course, deterrence is more than right sizing and force. Time is also a factor, especially since the PLA is racing toward parity with our military conventionally. So fielding B-21s as fast as possible would help reduce risk of PLA aggression over the next 10 years, not in some distant future. Slide. So a few facts to establish a baseline for analysis. Now, our report summarizes why our bomber force became the Air Force's smallest and oldest ever. And the very, very short answer is multiple force cuts that were driven by budgets and not strategy. Over time, the force's size went one direction down, 
as savings from retirements are used to sustain the remaining bombers. And of course, SecDef capped B-2 acquisition at 21 aircraft, even though multiple analyses showed they were more cost-effective than any other long-range strike capability in DoD. So translating that into operational speed, today's 141 bombers could theoretically generate 30, 40 sorties if all current combat-coded bombers were allocated to conflict. But those numbers don't account for operations to deter elsewhere and bombers that would be withheld from a fight to deter nuclear attacks, which is a national requirement. Slide. On to why more penetrating bombers are needed. Again, from an operator's perspective, defeating aggression like an invasion of Taiwan is a tough challenge. And we would be starting with major disadvantages like longer distances to the fight compared to PLA, logistics lines that stretch back to the US. And of course, we must bring our air and missile offenses with us into the battle space. So longer ranges translate to fewer sorties per day for aircraft that must fly hours to the fight and then return. And that's really a joint force operations problem. Navy carriers standing off 1,500 nautical miles or more to reduce the density of China's uh, anti-ship attacks means their air wings might have little impact on the initial fight in the Taiwan Strait. Slide. So let's uh, turn to capabilities we need to offset China's advantages. Greater range, overcome the tyranny of distance, more weapons for sortie to offset fewer sorties today, survivability to operate in contested environments. They're going to remain contested throughout the conflict. And of course, the range to operate from more distant bases, which can reduce the density of Chinese missile attacks on our forces and bases. Next slide. So here's another point. And you don't have to be a force planner to understand that defeating an invasion like this uh, will require striking an enemy's offensive forces. And those forces tend to be highly mobile. Halting an amphibious assault, uh, suppressing coastal SAMs and defenses on uh, service action groups screening Taiwan could require thousands of warheads. Plus, most of those targets would be moving or highly mobile. And that's what the bottom graphic on this slide says. And that's from an Air Force weapons briefing. Perhaps 90% of a Denai and Blunt uh, campaign's targets could be mobile. My point is only bombers can bring the weapons mass plus range and precision to strike those mobile targets at scale in the very short time frames required by a theater commander. Yeah, other forces like attack subs and carriers will be critical to sea control, but they can't provide the offensive mass that our commanders will need. Slide. So longer ranges, larger payload survivability, and the organic means to find track and attack mobile targets are exactly what bombers bring to the fight. And the B-21 will take these capabilities to the next level. It'll be incredibly efficient, which will give it unmatched unrefueled ranges. And it'll also be able to penetrate highly contested environments to locate and strike those mobile targets. Now, it's also great to uh, have heard Secretary Austin say these words at the uh, B-21's rollout uh, last December, especially to the point that stealth remains a critical requirement for modern air combat, and the B-21 takes that to the next level. Next slide. So force planners must also determine the mix of systems needed for standoff and penetrating strikes. Both are needed, including the relative value of different munitions and aircraft airings. So this graphic is also from an Air Force briefing. It illustrates the weapons inventory the service needs targets that should be sized for, and important platform weapon relationships. So at the top of the pyramid, exquisite munitions like long-range hypersonic missiles can penetrate contested areas without penetrating aircraft. But those weapons tend to be very expensive to the point where DED will probably acquire them in very limited numbers for a small number of extremely high-value targets. And towards the bottom of the pyramid, the target count increases dramatically, and it's far more cost-effective to use penetrating aircraft against those targets because penetrating aircraft, like bombers and B-20, can carry smaller and less expensive weapons in greater numbers to hit them. Yes, stealth aircraft cost more, 
But there's a huge difference between dollars spent on aircraft and dollars spent on weapons. Namely, weapons are one-time use and aircraft are not. Next slide. So this will give you a sense of the strike capacity of a, a 300 bomber force, and it's just illustrative. Now, 5,800 aim points per day might seem like a huge number, but it's not when you consider an attack on Taiwan or the Baltic states in the future could uh, succeed in a week or two if we can't project enough combat power, if we can't defeat an amphibious assault, or if we cannot prevent enemy armor from breaking through NATO's defenses. Now, this number of uh, aim points also assumes that every mission-capable bomber in the uh, Air Force's inventory would deploy to the fight, which again, would not be the case. And it's not just a matter of sortie count, but the simultaneity of our operations. We need enough force structure to keep pressure on an enemy continuously instead of striking in episodic ways like pulse operations. So we'll give an enemy's forces blocks of time to regenerate, reposition, and keep their offensive going. Slide. Now, the worst time to figure out you don't have enough force structure is when you're surprised, like many of us were, when Russia actually invaded Ukraine. We can't play catch up in the middle of a peer conflict like we did during World War II because we don't have the industrial base to surge aircraft, munitions, logistics production. And we also shouldn't assume another aggressor wouldn't take advantage of our engagement in a major fight in the Pacific to uh, make a move that we can't deter and defeat because we size our military one more. And that's why we should size our mama force for two conflicts, not just one. I'm happy to go into that in more detail during a, a Q&A slide. So on to the third pillar for sizing our bomb force, nuclear deterrence. Now, the current former commanders of uh, STRATCOM has said, we must now deter two nuclear peers, Russia and China, instead of a single peer as we have for decades. Why? Well, despite the declining status of Russia's conventional forces due to uh, Putin's terrible decision to invade Ukraine, its nuclear forces remain formidable. And let's not forget that Russia's nuclear modernization effort, which started about 20 years ago, is 85 to 86% complete. We're still at the starting gate in terms of actually rolling out new capability into the field. And China is spreading to uh, warhead parity with us. Its triad already has more ICBMs than we do. So we recommend DoD should begin to increase its triad capacity as needed to deter both Russia and China. And dual capable B-21s would be the most cost-effective way to do that because they're a two-for-one deal. Daily flyers they can deploy on, bomber task force to support the COCOM's theater deterrence priorities, and then if necessary in a crisis, uh, return to the U.S. and generate to nuclear alert status. Next slide. So let's wrap it up. We're hearing a lot about uh, China possibly making a move on Taiwan later this decade when the size of our forces will be reaching new lows. So this chart shows the gap between our bomber inventory and what the Air Force has said it needs, the horizontal black line. And below it's on the left are some of the factors uh, that could extend this gap. For instance, uh, at a theoretical production rate of 89 B-21s per year, it might take until the 2040s to build up to a force of 225 total bombers. And retiring B-1s and B-2s as B-1s are delivered would add to the problem. Slide. Here's the other side of the coin. These actions can help reduce the gap faster and enhance deterrence. Keep current bombers in the force until the B-21 reaches FOC. Now that might take increasing the Air Force's budget top line and possibly end strength to support the transition from one bomber to the other and maintaining current capabilities. And also that last point, maximize B-21 acquisition rate. Slide. We recommend ramping up B-21 production as quickly as possible to a rate of 20 or more per year. That would be consistent with the actual or planned rates for each of our last four bombers, as this graphic shows. So I'd like to conclude by pointing out that little quote on the right side of the slide. Uh, that defense official set that up two weeks ago was exactly right. More money cannot buy back lost time, but we can invest wisely to buy down future risk. 
And that's why we recommend rebuilding our penetrating bomber force as quickly as possible. And with that, thank you for watching. And I look forward to, uh, to your questions. General Dutula, back to you. Yeah, you bet, Gonzo. And uh, thanks very much uh, for that uh, overview. Um, I, I can't tell you uh, how much um, that effort in your analysis uh, it does uh, to kind of set the record straight and uh, speak honestly about what's required uh, to establish an effective deterrent force um, on behalf of uh, um, our military. Uh, and I'm reminded of the old quote that, uh, you know, there's nothing that's more expensive uh, than a first rate force than a second rate force. Uh, and uh, you you certainly underline uh, the logic for um, why that that's true and why it's important uh, that we uh, look to plus up our uh, B-21 force. So with that, um, Armo, let me uh, move on uh, and offer you the opportunity to share some of your perspectives on this topic before we uh, dive into questions. So over to you. No, I would add uh, my thanks for being here today uh, with the both of you to talk about this. Uh, I will say that Gonzo just did a fantastic job of aggregating and analyzing a lot of good work that's been done in, in kind of local ways, but uh, you really did um, kind of bring it all together in this report in a way that's really useful for thinking about the fundamental questions that really confront us now. Uh, because we we are in that uh, modernization phase for the triad, uh, we are in uh, at decision points as to uh, you know the size of the future force and how it's constituted and how it's composed, and so uh, these the ability to really kind of aggregate and think deeply about that right now is is hugely valuable. So that's exciting. Um, the other thing I would say, uh, aside from that, within the the military community, uh, how we're thinking about this. We're starting to work on, on concepts of operation really aggressively now about how this will play out uh, in the current bomber mix as we make the B-21 more ready as it comes online uh, when it comes to weapons, sensors, command and control. And, and the team that we've assembled is actually really exciting to do that because it's not, uh, I would say it's not a tribal team. We've We've really brought in um, different thinkers to say, how does this concept play out uh, with reframing problems and with uh, trying different weapons pairings, trying different sensor pairings, things like that, and what that means to the force composition and how to do it better, but then also what works and what doesn't. So that's a, it's a really exciting time in the background as we start to think through that problem as well. Um, then the one thing I would add just to amplify, you know, the recommendations that Gonzo makes really does capture a lot of history as well. And that's that really comes out in the report. I, I, that's actually probably one of my favorite parts of the report is, is the historical aspect of, of how we've gotten to where we are right now. Um, I think we probably would argue that maybe going back 10 or 20 years, we would have made slightly different choices. But um, how do we make the best with what we have now? And, and we're thinking very hard about that as well. And that comes down to um, uh, weapons and command and control for the most part. How do we network better? How do we, how do we uh, uh, go from ISR to targeting faster? How do, we, uh, how do we become more robust and resilient in, in the face of contested space? And so those, those are all uh, things that we're thinking about in the background. And then the one other thing I would add, um, you know, really the coin of the realm, what we're really seeing makes the difference. And the B-21 has amplified this point for us in, in how we think through the CONOPS is range off the boom matters greatly. And it's not just range by itself, but what do you get when you come off a boom? And whether it's, and range translates to time as well, right? So when you have that capacity for weapon stations and you have time and distance to work with, it opens up many, many possibilities for what's possible, so. All right. Well, great. Thanks for that, um, Armo. Let's jump into some uh, questions uh, before we uh, um, we open it up uh, for the audience. Um, China said its military modernization program uh, is on pace to prepare the PLA to 
invade Taiwan by 2027. And I'd also note that if you look at our um, FIDEP, our Air Force will be even smaller and older than it is today, marking an all-time low, uh, and that includes its long-range strike forces. So, uh, Armo, given enough resources, what are your thoughts on um, how DOD and the Air Force can begin to fill the bomber bathtub and reduce risk in this decade? So you're exactly right. Um, threats are diversifying. Threats are amplifying. They're, um, they're uh, becoming more complex. Uh, and, and we had a little brief discussion ahead of this, this Zoom call about uh, what lessons we should be learning from Russia and Ukraine right now. Um, and I think we need to take great care to not learn the wrong lessons more than even maybe learning the right lessons. Um, so that that diversification of threats, uh, the the intensification of threats, really has driven us to think with our what, what our current resources are. How do we how do we take kind of a systems of systems approach to to really make our command and control better, make our targeting processes better, make our ability to hold at risk and integrate in different ways um, uh, more powerful now. And I will tell you that that is bearing fruit. One of the things that's, that's why it's bearing fruit is because we're, we're challenging, um, again, the tribal aspects of, of mission conduct or force composition. When we integrate and think about integrated deterrence, which was a, a big catchword for you know, the national defense strategy, um, that actually means something when you play it out at the operational levels and how you integrate with other forces. And it is, it, it's, it all it doesn't go without saying that when you integrate effectively, um, you're more than two plus two equals four. Um, you are, uh, it's almost an exponential effect when you can, um, you know, mix weapons, uh, mix effects across domains, command and control that, and and think through those contested problems now. And, and we're learning a lot, I would offer, from uh, Bomber Task Force in those very ways. Uh, we're thinking about it as an all-domain problem. We're thinking about it as a global problem. And, and the things that we're learning from Bomber Task Force with those, those local presence um, in different theaters uh, are really helping us think through how to, how to strengthen what we have now to make us more ready for when the, the B-21 comes online. Yeah, the, the, for what it's worth, I, those are excellent points. Um, uh, and, and a lot of it is intangible because you can't count or you can't touch improved command and control. Uh, but it certainly does evidence itself uh, when it comes time uh, to put uh, uh, steel on target. Um, Armo, you've been with us before to discuss affordable mass uh, and the need to have the right munitions in the Air Force's inventory. Uh, could you talk a bit on uh, the future weapons mix and how a right-sized force of uh, penetrating B-21s could change this mix? Yeah, I think um, that kind of goes to the team we've assembled to work on uh, CONOPS, actually. And, um, and, the, and Secretary Kendall has helped us quite a bit with our thinking, I would argue, through the operational imperatives and through uh, how those things cut across, uh, cross-cutting imperatives, uh, that go beyond, you know, a, a long-range strike or air superiority. Uh, that truly, uh, as we look at weapons, weapons balances, sensor balances, and command and control, how you how you do what the oper operational imper imperatives demand, um, that's helped us to kind of re-ask those fundamental questions. Um, and we have we see real opportunities as we make decisions about B twenty one, decisions about NGAD, and decisions about um, CCAs. Uh, we have the ability to kind of challenge uh, the fundamental questions and, and re-ask those questions in ways that uh, get us across domains. So uh, it's kind of a hard question to answer um, at the cl classification level we're at, but, but the bottom line is, um, again, because these are fundamental opportunities, they ask fundamental questions, we can, we can get past uh, what I would argue is is siloed thinking or capabilities based thinking, and start thinking about threat based thinking, uh, which Gonzo again lays out very well in the report. You know, uh, flying in 2019, flying a B B1 over the 
middle Euphrates River Valley or a B-52 over Mosul is a completely different proposition than um, going into contested and denied airspace um, in the Western Pacific. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Uh, Gonzo, in the report and in your presentation, you talked a bit about current U.S. force planning assumptions and how they can really support only a one war capability, uh, if that. Um, could you expand on this a bit and uh, discuss uh, uh, just why our nation needs a two war bomber force? Absolutely. Uh, so I'll start by saying DOD did size for two wars for, for decades. It had a two war force sizing construct, plus homeland defense and nuclear deterrence. Those are all additive. And I'll, I'll quote DOD's 1993 bottom up review report. We were both in that journal uh, saying why that was important. Quote, we do not want a potential aggressor in one region to be tempted to take advantage if we're already engaged in a halting aggression and halting aggression in another region. So in 2018, the defense strategy shifted to a one war or sizing construct. So why the change? Simple answer is budget. budget. Bingo. Some in DD believe they and still do that a two war force is simply unaffordable. The threat certainly hasn't changed. In fact, the risk of uh, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea taking advantage of that U.S. engagement in a major flight in other theaters would be greater today than any time during the last 30 years. Bottom line, you know, sizing for one war increases risk that another adversary would take advantage that we have sized our force, our munitions, our logistics, and other capabilities to respond to just one contingency. But that doesn't mean that all U.S. forces must be sized for two wars. That would be wasteful. The Army's big fight is in Europe, and the Navy's is in the Pacific, and they should size accordingly. But at the very least, our bomber force should be sized for two theater conflicts, because it will be the lead force, the foundation of any campaign to defeat a Chinese or Russian invasion. And we're behind the curve already, given that the Air Force is already five bomber squadrons short of what's needed for a single war plus nuclear deterrence. No, thanks very much for bringing that up. How, how did you come up with that five bombers, uh, bomber squadron short? Yeah, that is straight out of Air Force analysis, which they did at the classified level and reported out. That's right out of the Air Force we need. And that's right. Do you think that those uh, numbers, do you think those numbers are still viable? Uh, viable, yes, but I think the shortfall is now much, much greater than that, especially if you go to a two-war construct. The Air Force assessment was exactly according to the 2018 National Defense Strategy. One war, deter a lesser aggressor somewhere else, and, uh, of course, uh, Homeland Defense and nuclear deterrence. Yeah, those are uh, uh, the, the reason I'm uh, trying to pull this out in more detail is these are extraordinarily important points um, that unfortunately simply have not gotten the attention that they deserve uh, because, you know, the, the, the predominant approach coming out of the department is, hey, look, the budget that we have is fine. Um, you, you know, we can handle what we've got with uh, or what we need to, with what we've got. Um, and uh, from a uh, national defense perspective, that's simply not accurate. Um, the, the current uh, resources that we have are insufficient to meet the demands of the national security strategy, uh, period, dot. Okay, let's also expand now uh, the discussion. Hey, uh, uh, General Deptulo, I want to offer yeah. something on that, too, actually, that, that sure. I think— um, you know, we just the DOD just came out with uh, the joint concept for competition as well. And and so uh, when we talk about I think it's easy from a budget perspective to talk about one war, two war, because we know the numbers. But when we're talking about competition, that drives a, that drives an intensity into the force that drives a requirement into the force that is on the spectrum actually of deterrence. Right. Because the intent of competition is to demonstrate and 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 show that it is not worth uh, coming at us right now. And so that competition level of uh, force requirement 
almost doesn't get captured when you look at the binary requirements of war or peace. And so I think that's that's also part of the conversation that has to happen. No, that's a, a an excellent point, uh, Armo, which brings us to another enduring requirement for the Air Force, and that's deterring nuclear attacks against the United States. Um, we know, but many don't, that the Air Force is responsible for two legs of our triad, uh, our nuclear-capable ICBMs as well as bombers. Uh, so, Armo, what are your thoughts on the current state of our triad and the steps necessary to deter uh, two nuclear near-peer rivals with one of them uh, sort of on the breakout uh, with uh, no arms control agreements in place uh, to uh, uh, limit the Chinese expansion of their nuclear capabilities? No, I think, uh, again, that's why I like the, the historical aspects of Gonzo's report, because it plays back into some of those decisions and, and choices that have been made in the past that, I, you know, in some ways we wish we could go back on. Um, the 2001 uh, Nuclear Posture Review uh, is, a, is a fascinating document to me because it came out just prior to 9-11. But what it said was, hey, uh, we need to look hard at modernization here. Uh, Russia had undertaken it or had made the decision to undertake it at that point um, and, and was rapidly modernizing um, had, with intent to modernize their uh, nuclear forces as the primary uh, force structure. <laughs> Um, and and that uh, what that nuclear posture review said was, hey, we're gonna we're gonna have a big problem in 2020 if we don't start getting after it now, because it's gonna it's going to uh, uh, all come at once, and and that's kind of where we are now. So some of these budget choices um, have been uh, as a result of deferred choices that we we knew about, but um, world events kind of overtook them, and so. The historical aspects of this report really uh, lend a lot of depth to that discussion. Um, the interesting thing to me, too, about the triad is, is there's a lot of debate. There's, you know, kind of a cyclical debate cycle about the value of a triad. But every administration has landed in the same place. The value of the triad is, is inherent to what it does, militarily speaking, right? You have the stability that comes from ICBMs. You have the assured response from uh, cruise missiles off of submarines, I'm sorry, uh, submarine launch ballistic missiles. You have uh, the visibility and the flexibility of a bomber force. Because of if you don't have those things, you don't have the, the underlying principles of deterrence, which is credibility and capability. Um, and so if you hollow out inside of that spectrum of capability requirements, uh, anything that doesn't do th those things, then you're ceding that territory to those who will grab those things. And so the, the value of the triad uh, is, is very important, but we are kind of in a modernization um, pinch right now across the triad. Now, I would say um, some of the, what's, what are some of the benefits of having waited to where we are now? We've, we've, we've been able to make some very interesting and good choices with both Sentinel and Raider uh, B-21 with regards to where we are on open mission systems and op open architectures. So that has actually resulted in what I think is gonna be a better outcome for the sustainability, maintainability, operational effectiveness of those platforms going forward because that, that uh, design is inherent to the design now. And so, so there's some real opportunities and we're, we're making sure we cover those as well. Um, and so uh, it's interesting also in your presentation, Gonzo, probably didn't affect others in the same way it affects me. But every time I see a picture of those missile fields in China, um, you know, that kind of caught everybody off guard. I think it was in 2019 when, when they were starting to publicly speak about those. Admiral Richard, as a STRATCOM commander, was very vocal about that, and uh, uh, rightly so. And, and, and you're right, we are on pace. China is on pace to fill the gaps in their triad. And so... Um, we need to think hard about that and 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 make smart choices about what our force composition is to address that. Uh, thanks very much for that. Um, let me kind of expand this discussion by uh, also noting that there's some out there who believe that expanding our dual capable bomber force uh, could lead to nuclear instability. Um, for that matter, uh, some have even voiced concerns over using uh, dual-capable bombers 
uh, to threaten targets on the Chinese mainland during a major conflict. Um, how, how would you address uh, those concerns? And I'm happy for either of you to comment on this one. Yeah, I'll say um, I'll say this. I'll t- toss it to Gonzo because I'm sure his he, he will have great things to say on it. You know, I think again it goes back to <clears throat> what a triad does, but then what do bombers do within that triad? And really, the best way I think to deter because that's the objective is to not fight a nuclear war, but to not fight a nuclear war, you have to be prepared to actually fight a nuclear war. And the best way to deter nuclear war is to be prepared to fight a limited nuclear war. So what you don't want to do is get trapped in uh, high and right responses where your only response is, is, is massive retaliation, or and you don't want to get trapped in where the, the adversary gets to escalate for free. You know, there, there's a lot of good discussion in, in Gonzo's report about the fait accompli strategy, and that's essentially what it is. It's essentially they will escalate to win. And if if your adversary has composed their force such that they will escalate to win, you have to say, if you are going to fight that fight, you say you do not get to escalate to win. We have options across conventional and nuclear to respond in the ways that the president uh, sees fit. Uh, But if you take those options off the table, you potentially um, reduce the response options and a fait accompli strategy becomes essentially um, valid. And so I would argue that those who say that a dual capable bomber force is not needed and or um, military targets on the mainland of whatever country is, is trying to escalate to win, whether it is in the conventional or nuclear arena, um, I think that's exactly, that. I would call that a self-deterring um, response to, um, to an adversary. You're, you're essentially ceding that territory to them. So Gonzo, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, real quick, uh, I'll tell you that we've heard for years, uh, folks in the arms control community usually argue that, oh, nuclear-capable cruise missiles are destabilizing. And uh, now we're hearing that, oh, using dual-capable bombers to strike China's uh, uh, mainland would risk a nuclear response. Uh, Just doesn't stand up to the facts. Deterrence centers on the perceptions of our adversaries. So looking at it from a Chinese and Russian perspective, Both have multiple dual-capable aircraft, ballistic missiles, and cruise missiles, and they continue to develop new variants, all the above. They don't see those dual-capable weapons as destabilizing, and in a fight, I'm sure they won't hesitate to use them conventionally against us. So if you also did not use the B-21 against uh, mainland China to uh, attack a number of targets that only the B-21, frankly, could reach, that would create operational sanctuaries in PLA, especially deep in China's interior where no U.S. conventional standoff weapon can now reach. And that would include potential targets like anti-satellite uh, weapon installations, uh, uh, some of their uh, uh, ballistic missile uh, garrisons and so forth. So not having the ability to do that eliminates it as an option. And it would hurt, not help our ability to deter a conflict with China in the first place. Okay, well, um, very good on that. Um, Our report, uh, Gonzo, addresses how uh, uh, China has spent the last 30 years expanding and modernizing its forces, and that's to a large extent because it actually learned the lessons from the Desert Storm Air campaign. Uh, So could you both... uh, Discuss a bit about how uh, future family uh, long-range strike systems will help regain our losses in precision strike advantage um, over the last uh, 30 years or so? Yeah, well, let me kick it off. Top of my list is mass, or as I said during the briefing, mass plus precision at range. Now, many of us were in uniform when we experienced the benefits from maturing precision guidance technologies in in the 1990s. And we all use the term precision has replaced mass, which to an extent was true. But that argument was also used by DOD to justify retiring large numbers of our combat aircraft in the 90s. And they also failed to uh, uh, build a fifth generation Air Force claiming a lack of a threat. But 
The problem is today, defenses that have been developed and fielded by China, Russia, and others are now far more effective against fourth gen aircraft and the weapons they carry, which means our precision strike advantage has eroded. So now precision plus mass plus more survivability is needed. We need all three. And that's what the long range strike family of systems with a B-21 as its foundation will give us. One, one last point, the family systems approach helped reduce the cost of the B-21, and that was intentional. But not just to reduce its costs, but is to ensure the Air Force can buy a larger number of B-21s. So that larger force was and is a key objective. Armo, anything to add to that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the concepts that we're kind of driving on, uh, we're calling it global surveillance strike. And so um, that family of systems approach is hugely valuable uh, because again, it goes, it goes back to command and control. It goes back to kill chains and it goes back to uh, platforms, weapons, and sensor pairings. And, and, and the, what you get out of those local pairings and what you can do then subsequently do if you have options for mass on a long range, all aspect broadband stealth platform that um, are completely different from an inside perspective than, than a linear attack the attack the fortress wall perspective from a traditional force perspective, right? When you're inside of something and you can, you can attack in multiple directions, uh, you can do pretty incredible things that have intensifying effects. And so it's almost like a raid concept across domains. And that it goes back to the integration I was talking about earlier as well. That results in strike efficiency, which really then what it what that does is that burden shares the bill, if we want to go back to money, but burden sh shares the bill across what you get out of having an all aspect broadband, long range, high capacity bomber. Um, you've essentially bought that space and you can burden share on weapons now and sensors the ability to affect that contested space. Whereas if you're, if you're uh, you know, all standoff strike, uh, to Gonzo's point in the report and what he said earlier, you're going to have to have some, some exquisite weapons that can get there very quickly, uh, and or you're going to have to have exquisite sensors, and or you're going to have to buy the fact that you can't do anything in time. And so um, the B-21 unlocks that uh, options for other, other uh, weapons. Uh, those how we're thinking about that global surveillance strike concept also is it it makes for a very robust kill chain. It 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 just it makes it such that um, you can decide what to do and affect things in time. And then the the other thing I would add is it's very fungible, right? You can do different things with it, and you can do that. Um, you can exploit opportunities that you wouldn't have a, have the opportunity to take advantage of otherwise. Um, you can, you know, if you want to get get into Boyd, you can talk about there's a fast transient that you can be inside of now rather than um, having to watch happen and then try and figure out how to exploit later. That's great. Um, uh, after this, I'm going to send you a brief that's entitled uh, Global Reconnaissance Strike or GRS that uh, you know, what goes around comes around uh, that uh, you might appreciate taking a look at. One last question for you, Armo, before we open it up uh, to our audience. Um, with respect to deterrence and resilience in a fight, uh, do you think, or, 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 or let me put it this way, not put you on the spot, but is there value in reconsidering um, establishing a permanent bomber presence uh, in Guam uh, and yours truly actually had a big hand in that, and possibly other forward bases. Um, and is that something that would drive a larger bomber force? Well, you know, the force, uh, uh, the decisions, so I'll say it this way, um, you know, having just come from Germany, uh, you know, from six months there, I, I kind of kept my eye on the bomber task force too, because they're in the they're in the daily briefs, right, to the chairman. Um, and and uh, a lot of folks watch those. Uh, and, and that integration uh, matters, that uh, pairing with coalition matters, which is uh, kind of the West or the United States superpower, right? Our partners and allies 
are our uh, it's 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 something that China and Russia don't have, right? Um, and so that that forward force presence, I think every COCOM you would never get asked a, a COCOM that question, and they would not say we want more because we hear that every day um, um, from them. And so uh, posture matters, forward presence matters, and lacking numbers, you have to come up with creative ways to to address that. Um, and so I think it, 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 would, it would be a very rich discussion to say, how would we allocate, if, if we had a blue sky approach to bombers, um, how would we allocate uh, where they would be and how we would use them? Because you could do, because the B-21 can, oper can, can operate from sanctuary, you can also do different things with the B-21 forward, right? You can increase uh, operational tempo, uh, which is a, in effect, a mass discussion and a capacity discussion. And so uh, it, that would be a very rich discussion, I think. It, it would require hard choices potentially, but it'd be a very rich discussion. Uh, no, um, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, excellent way to, uh, to tee it up. And um, we ought to have that discussion. Uh, and there is so much more to talk about, but uh, what I wanna do is move to audience questions. Um, we've got several really good questions already in the chat room. Um, if any of you would like to uh, raise your hand and ask one uh, over the, the video here, uh, just, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll grab you. But until then, I don't see any raised hands right now, but I'll go right to the, uh, the, to the Q&A. Um, the first one is from an autonomous attendee. Uh, uh, autonomous, anonymous. Uh, it might be autonomous too, but um, I can understand why when you hear the question. Uh, in a CRS report from January 23, uh, OSD CAPE, Cost Analysis and Program Evaluation Office, stated that the Army's long range hypersonic weapon will cost $4.4 billion for development and $2.5 billion produ for production. Is this the best use of resources to accomplish long-range strike in the Western Pacific? Short answer, no. Not only no, but hell no, uh, and not even close. Um, and then the second part of his question is, is the um, long-range hypersonic weapon even capable against the mobile targets that we expect to see for Chinese coastal targets? Once again, the short answer is no. Um, there are a variety of reasons for this, um, and it's unfortunate that you don't see more open debate inside the Department of Defense uh, discussing this subject. We have a limited number of resources. We need to be applying them to the most effective, the most cost-effective solutions. And hypersonic uh, land-based missiles that cost uh, 45 to $55 million a shot um, that you can't deploy uh, the launch system during peacetime. And because of the size and the weight and the vulnerability and the demand on mobility systems, you're not going to be able to move it during wartime. Uh, it, it is a, well, let's just put it this way, not the most wise employment of um, our resources. Imagine if that uh, combined uh, six point, well, I'm sorry, $7.1 billion um, was spent on improving air defenses for the variety of locations that we operate from in the Pacific. That would be a much better use of the money. Uh, Gonzo, you want to add anything else? Yeah. Uh, so you take two of those uh, long range hypersonic weapons. You can buy an F-35 for that. An F-35 is going to be in the force for 30 years. It's going to fly multiple sorties and deliver multiple, multiple weapons during a fight versus LRHW two aim points. Doesn't stack up from a cost-effective perspective. That's not the best use for resources. In terms of its capability against mobile targets, hardened targets, we're talking tiny little warheads on our hypersonic weapon. I'm not anti-hypersonic. We should mature the technology, perhaps acquire limited numbers of them. But hypersonic weapons, service to service especially, are extraordinarily expensive. 
and even air to service, they're not going to be the level of effort kind of weapons, as the Air Force calls them, we need for a theater uh, campaign. They're just too costly. And there are other ways to achieve the kind of survivability we need, including perhaps uh, high uh, supersonic uh, weapons in the future. Yeah, I'm reminded of the chart that you showed, uh, the pyramid. And uh, this would be right at the very, very peak of the pyramid. Uh, the other point is, too, if you look at this from a true joint approach, um, not just a very parochial single service approach, um, if you look at air launched, uh, you cut the cost in half uh, and, and you avoid a heck of a lot of other problems uh, because you don't need to pre-position uh, on a country that most likely is not going to allow you to pre-position during peacetime. Uh, you, you can move and employ these weapons um, uh, across those 16 time zones in the Pacific um, at 600 miles an hour, uh, not zero miles an hour. So enough on that. Uh, let's uh, move to uh, Tony Hu, who has an excellent question. To deter China, we must hold at risk China's interior weapon system launch sites and airfields. Will the B-21s range off the boom be able to do that? So I won't uh, give specific details, but, you know, we are tasked uh, to hold all targets at risk. And so, um, you know, Matthew Cronick wrote a really good book, The Logic of American Nuclear, uh, American Nuclear Strategy, I think. Um, and uh, he talks about strategic superiority. And, and to do that, you have to um, deny the benefits of nuclear use to the from the adversary's perspective. But from, from our perspective, the way you do that is you have military targets. And so you, to hold those targets at risk, you have to have the capability and the credibility to do that. And so um, I would say Anytime you build a scenario in which only a single target can be reached by only a single weapon, that is not optimum. And, and the purpose of the triad is to account for that. So I would say that the answer is, um, you know, that is that is what, uh, you know, our politicians uh, order us to do is to hold targets at risk. And so I would say that that would be something we would look hard at. I was like uh, uh, something it's, uh, I believe it's in the report or perhaps an earlier report, and I can't pull the number, the exact number out of my head, but it was along the lines of a 2,500 to 3,000 nautical mile unrefueled combat radius combined with a 400 nautical mile uh, standoff weapon will reach any target on the face of the earth, period. So uh, okay. off Thanks of that. for that. All right, let's move to a uh, raised hand. Uh, my old uh, friend and uh, partner, uh, of many years ago, um, retired Lieutenant General Bob Elder. Bob, go ahead with your question. The uh, the question I had was, you saw the chart that uh, uh, Mark showed about the weapons mix uh, to, to really be able to deal with some of the threats that we're dealing with. And my question for you really is, is the Air Force buying uh, the mix of weapons that would allow us to best optimize the B-21, and if not, what changes do we need to be making to uh, to fully exploit this uh, phenomenal capability? I think that's directed at you, Armo. Oh, okay, copy. Sorry, I thought that was to Gonzo. My apologies. Um, yeah, we're we are absolutely. This is uh, we we work on this every single day. Um, I would say um, we're thinking about what's kind of the immediate concern what what is uh, what do we look like you know five years from now uh, what do we look like 10 years from now and then what do we look like uh, 15 years from now kind of kind of those are the time horizons I would say we've been um, expected capabilities to balance uh, the ability to hold at risk those kind of targets right to to, to contest denied airspace to uh, unlock legacy platforms as they currently exist and and will exist into the future and then to make it best of, uh, the best pairing and advantage of um, a weapons complex. And when I, by complex, I mean, we don't buy a single use weapon for, you know, the example you gave of, uh, you know, a, a hypersonic land-based hypersonic. Um, although I would, I could see many uses for that in, in, in a joint force, right? Where, uh, 
which could unlock some things in different ways for other strike aircraft, right? And so that's kind of how we're approaching it. It's a, it's a, it's a very hard question to answer specifically because where you are in a complex of weapons in a threat scenario uh, is how that plays out in, in operational planning. And so, but we are thinking really hard about that to aim at strike efficiency. We don't want to buy things we can't use, are unnecessary, um, are, are too exquisite for a specific target, um, and, and can't be useful in a complex way. Now, I'll answer that uh, I had the opportunity to take a look at the Air Force's portfolio of weapons that are in development over the last couple of weeks. The Air Force is absolutely developing the right mix of weapons. My concern is buying enough of them for a peer conflict, plus the other missions that uh, we've been talking about. A rate of 500 uh, Jazz and Ds, for example, year by year by year, isn't going to give us the capacity we need. And the Lorazm production count is much lower than that and is split with the Navy. So all those new weapons, they are going to be fantastic, but they're not in production. We need to move them into production and begin buying them as fast as possible. Yeah, uh, just for uh, uh, order of magnitude uh, setting here, in the 24 budget Lorazms, uh, we're buying 27. You know, how's that stack up against, uh, you know, a potential uh, PRC invasion of Taiwan that's going to involve thousands of, uh, uh, of ships? Um, okay, we've got a couple other hands here. How about, uh, let's go to Sagman Lee. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we okay. got you now. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. I have a question to uh, General Jason Amagors. Um, I want to know about relations between B-21 and North Korea threat. So how does B-20 influence U.S. extended deterrence against North Korea? And also, is there any possibility that B-21 will be deploying Guam to deter North Korea and China? That's a good question. That, I kind of touched on that with regards to, you know, our superpower with integration with our partners and allies. And so I would look at uh, North Korea as a lesser included threat capability of something like a, a peer adversary like Russia or China, where they are significant. But, um, you know, if, if the B-21 is designed and operationalized in a way that it is relevant in, uh, you know, deny their space around China or um, uh, Russian SAM systems and, and those kind of things, then, then it will absolutely be capable of handling those lesser included cases of North Korea, Iran, um, kind of the, the named uh, exploiters of a potential, you know, single war, kind of to Gonzo's point about a two war bomber force. And so um, it would it would absolutely be capable in those environments is a short answer. OK, thanks for that. We're getting close on time. There's a bunch of great questions out here, but I got one more hand up and that's uh, Bill Fosnia. Bill, go ahead. OK, I'm unmuted. Um, you know, I learned so much on these discussions. Uh, I was an enlisted guy just to set the stage. So I didn't know what you guys were doing or thinking back in the 60s and 70s. But here's, here's what I don't hear right now is how do we plan on supporting these aircraft, which are so technically advanced? It doesn't take the average Joe with a screwdriver. I never hear about advanced deployment of personnel, et cetera. So that's it. That's my question. How do that's we a, plan on supporting these? Well, that's, yeah, that's if I a, may, Bill, that's a great question. Yes, and yeah. um, just real quick, one of the things that's designed into the B-21 is its flyability, for lack of a better term. And mm -hmm. what that means is flyability is its maintainability is much, much greater and easier uh, than its predecessor, the B-2, which required exquisite maintenance after every sortie. Um, so that's the short answer. And let me hand off over to Armo to add anything else. 
No, that we're although it doesn't get a lot of airtime, right? In these kind of discussions, that is a huge part of what again what we do every day. Um, the I will tell you the B twenty one is absolutely built to do what General Deptula just said, which is to fly, but to be maintainable. Um, it, it was designed with um, short maintainers, tall maintainers uh, in in a virtual constructed environment so that they understand now how to change an engine. They understand, could we make a design change in the structure to make a panel that more easily accesses a hydraulic system? So, um, and I would actually argue that in doing that, they simplified the maintenance and sustainability. So to your point about the high-tech nature of the, the, the platform, um, it's actually resulted in benefits of simplicity from a perspective of maintenance and sustainment. All right. Well, thanks for that. And unfortunately, and we got some great questions today uh, that we're unable to get to, but we've come to the end of our time. And uh, General Armagas, thanks again for being here at Gonzo. Uh, thanks for a frapping awesome paper, which is now available on our website at mitchellaerospacepower.org. So please go check it out. Um, and to our audience from all of us at Mitchell Institute, have a great aerospace power kind of day out here.